to be here this morning. I hope uh, that you'll be blessed uh, in your worship uh, together with us in the Lord and uh, that the word that you hear will touch your heart and uh, change your mind maybe about some things that you're doing in your life and help you to understand what God wants from you. Uh, in this regard, I'd like to uh, study with you and speak to you about the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 verse 14. I'll just read the first three verses. Uh, from verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. I will spit you out of my mouth, he says. Hmm. I'm not going to go into all the idea of uh, trying to explain the angel. Angel can mean messenger. It could have been to the elders. It could have been to, an, to the angel in the spiritual sense who's looking after the congregation for God. Uh, but whatever it is, uh, he says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write. I need to remind you, when we read statements like this, I need to remind you, it was the Spirit of God who was speaking to the church at Laodicea. It was God through the Spirit. It was a revelation of Christ through the Spirit to John to pass on to this congregation. But if I say it's a, it's a message from God and it is the Word of God, does that make any impact on your soul? Because we go to this book all the time. We, we turn to the, this page, look at this verse, let's read this verse, let's, uh, and we read and uh, say, yes, that's interesting, move on, move on. But we need to stop and think, am I reading this and hearing God's voice in it? Am I reading this and feeling God's authority behind it? Am I reading this in a way that will allow God to change me into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, my Lord? These are questions that we need to be asking ourselves. And it will prepare us to listen attentively, uh, to listen and ponder what is said, to listen so as to change and grow in our understanding of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted them to do. He wanted them to listen. And they really needed to listen. They were in real trouble. They really needed to listen. At the end of the very last verse of uh, this letter, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I'm not just affirming it. It's been affirmed in the Scriptures. Another thing I want you to grasp is that these, this church was a church of Christ. You see, back there, there was no denominations. There was no Baptist church, Methodist church, Catholic church, and all the denominations. You could go on for hours naming all the denominations. Back then, all the congregations that were established by Paul and Peter and the other uh, workers were churches of Christ. Just look at Romans 16, 16. He was telling them to greet one another with a holy kiss. He says, all the churches of Christ greet you. And incidentally, just, it might be helpful to you when people here in Ireland say to you, uh, what church do you belong to? And I say, Church of Christ. 
And they say back, I've never heard of that church. Oh, is that right? Well, let me show you here in the Bible that there were churches of Christ all over the world in the first century. And I don't read of any other group that was there in the first century. So they were churches of Christ. And churches of Christ are composed of the saints whom God added to the church. Acts 2 verse 47. You're probably very familiar with that. So the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So when we talk about the church, we must conceive of people who have been forgiven of their sin, who have faith in God, who have repented of their sins, who have been baptized into Jesus Christ our Lord, who are saints, sanctified, forgiven of their sins, and made acceptable to God. That's what a church of Christ is. When, when this letter was written, it was written to the people of God. I know it says some bad things, uh, and there's a lot of correction to be made here, but they were still the children of God, and Jesus Christ treats them as his people and seeks their well-being and welfare. This is not always true of us, even though we're fellow Christians. We don't always seek each other's well-being and welfare. I mean their spiritual well-being and welfare. Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. He says, to the church of God. Incidentally, the church of God and the church of Christ are the same thing. It's like the throne of God and the throne of Christ are the same thing. Revelation 22. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. That sanctification is forgiveness, a setting apart from the world, and a dedication to God. These people had been forgiven through the blood of Christ. Their sins had been washed away. They were set apart from the world, no longer to live as a worldly person, a fleshly person. And they were dedicated to God for the purpose of serving God. Sanctified, where in Christ Jesus we're told. Saints by calling. These weren't dead people. Why am I saying that? Because saints in the Catholic tradition are those who are dead. These brethren were very much alive. When the church was being persecuted, Paul was going into the house of saints and dragging out people and having them imprisoned and mistreating them. They were very much alive. They were put in prison. How can that happen if they're dead? No use putting the corpse in prison. It means nothing to them. So we need to, we need to get our thoughts focused on the fact that you're a saint. If you've been washed by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have been sanctified. You are a saint. Does that bring any responsibility with it for you? If I was to say... I wish you'd walk worthy of your calling, both before God and before men. How would you feel? If we have public representatives, which we do, and they fall short of what they're supposed to be as public representatives, it's not wrong for us to say, I wish you'd be what you're supposed to be in the office that you hold. We hold this high calling of being saints. We need to walk worthy of that great calling with which God has called us in Jesus Christ our Lord. So there was a time in Laodicea, and I think we can very well believe this is a, an inference, when the saints were, or, or when the saints believed in Christ and faithfully obeyed his word. 
Now, of course, getting back to Revelation chapter 3, Jesus introduces himself by saying the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Jesus Christ, like the Father, cannot lie. He can only speak the truth. Truth is, truth is what he is. He's the embodiment of truth for us. He's the Amen. All, all of the promises in him, which are true, will be fulfilled for us. We can be absolutely assured of that. He does not change. So when he says the Amen, the, the faithful and true witness, he's, he's trying to get a message across to them immediately. And I think what's I I embedded in that uh, message is what the Apostle Paul wrote about in uh, I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, or uh, maybe it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Let's look there. Let me put down the wrong scripture here. <coughs> yeah, I did. Anyway, I read of, of uh, the reference to the scripture is wrong, but the scripture is right. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Oh, we've got that already. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 through 20 is what I want. Sorry. In verse 18, Paul says, but as God is faithful, notice that, God is faithful. He keeps his word. He's not fickle like you and me. We, we, just to, to, to tell you how fickle we can be, we made an oath before God when we got married that it was for better or for worse. Of course, what we meant is I want it for better, not for worse. But we said better or for worse. Richer or poorer, in sickness and in health. They're good words to, for us to use. I'm, I'm really unhappy or feel disquieted by the fact that people want to drop all that out of their marriage vows. But that's really what it's going to take. Now, as you go through life, there's all sorts of complications that come up. And you might even think at some stage, I'd be better off not married. Oh, that's good. That's really choice. But you made a promise. Well, I mean, that was such a long time. I was so young at that time. I didn't know what I was talking about. Yes, you knew what you were talking about back then, but you don't know what you're talking about now because you're not remembering you made the promise. You need to keep your word. If you're any way faithful, you know keeping your word is so important because it's so important for us to be able to trust Jesus Christ and his faithfulness. Otherwise, we're in big trouble. Let's look at verse 18. It says, But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. <clears throat> now, I don't know if people in, in other countries have a problem with yes and no. Uh, the Irish have a problem with yes and no. We're, we're a sensitive group of people. We don't like to hurt each other. We want to be agreeable. And sometimes when we're asked such and such a question, we say yes, but we really want to say no. But we don't want to hurt anybody. And sometimes it should be no, and we really want to say yes, but again, we don't want to hurt anybody. Now, that's a failing, especially as a Christian. We need to be able to speak the truth and love, and we need not, we should not be intimidated or forced to say what we don't want to say because we're not being truthful then. So it's not yes and no from God. 
For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but yes in him. Everything that God has promised is yes in Christ. I will fulfill it. I will guarantee it. I will bring it to pass, God is telling us. For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now that's what he's trying to get across to the Laodiceans. I'm not like you. You're compromising yourselves. You're, you can uh, hunt with the hounds and run with the hare. You can do it both ways. You are looking for the approval of men. You are inconsistent. Your service to me is not valid. But Jesus does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13 verse 8. Once we abide in him, remain in him, dwell in him, once we do that, all of the promises of God are guaranteed. They are yes in him. Now Jesus is also, as he says in that opening section, the beginning of the creation of God. There's no inference here that Jesus is a created being. Some suggest that that's the case. But I'm saying there is no inference here because Colossians explains it for us. Let's go to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 16. If you have your Bible, just follow with me because I'm, I'm making a lot of reference to scriptures because I believe the scripture is the word of God and it's more important that you hear what God has to say than what I've got to say. I'm really, and that's why I want you to read with me. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink. Where am I here? Colossians 1, yeah, 16. For by him all things were created. This is by Christ, by Jesus. All things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Think about that. He created everything that's to be created, whether you can see it or you can't see it, whether it's in heaven or on earth or in the cosmos. Everything is created by him and for him. Now, if you believe that this passage is saying Jesus is the first of God's creation in the sense that he was created, then you have to believe that Jesus created himself. That's what you have to believe. Which, I mean, is nonsense. Okay? Jesus came into his own creation, though, <coughs> And by becoming a man to die for the sins of humanity and to save our souls, he is very much connected with creation and he is the saviour of creation. He's the source of creation and the saviour of creation. So that's why this thought is, is introduced here. All right, so now we know he's faithful. Now we know he's head over and the source of all creation. That we're to look to him. Now in, in doing this, he, he must have made them feel how small they really are. How insignificant they really are. Humans are so proud, so full of themselves, so uh, puffed up by maybe been in a massive congregation by, by the richness of the contribution, by the uh, buildings, by the programs that they, they run, 
are so puffed up that they feel themselves to be God, maybe not with a capital G, but with a small g anyway, that they feel themselves to be God. We're, we're too full of ourselves. We need to measure ourselves by God or by our Lord Jesus Christ and then we'll see how insignificant we are. Yes, he puts an importance on your life. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he's prepared to hold your individuality intact. In but you are as nothing in the scheme of things. And we need to understand that and accept it because humility cannot come without that acceptance. Jesus says to them, I know your deeds. Said in, in the prayer this morning by James, I know your deeds. We're completely exposed before the Lord. But he knew that they were neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot, he says. Jesus knew their deeds. The eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good, according to Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3. It's, it's just, everything is naked and laid bare to the eyes of the Lord with whom we have to do. That's the way it really is. So you might be hiding from yourself. You might be burying things in your life or in your heart, deep as deep can be, to where you might even forget where you buried it. But he knows it. He knows where it's at. So if God can deal with it, can I not deal with it? Surely I can. Of course I can. When he says, I wish that you were hot or cold, he's saying, I wish you were one thing or another. Hot or cold, not lukewarm, not trying to be everything to all men, not trying to be compromising to the extent that you're compromising the word of God instead of your opinion. He wants us to be either hot or cold, not lukewarm. Ideally, they should have been hot for the spiritual things and cold to the fleshly material things in their lives. But they weren't. They wanted it all. You can't have it all. That's just the honest truth. You can't have it all. Now this might be hard for Americans to accept. <laughs> you can't have it all. <laughs> No, for the rest of the world it looks like you have it all. <laughs> so, but you can't have it all. That's the truth of the matter. <clears throat> and <clears throat> when, we, when we come before Jesus, or when these people were thinking about what Jesus was saying to them, they should have <clears throat> accepted what he was saying about them. Let, let's put it uh, in terms that we might understand. Um, We've had some hot days over the last few weeks, which is uh, very nice. I like it very much. A lot of people don't like it. But uh, there's nothing like when you come in and you're all sweaty and, and you go to the fridge to get a cold drink and you take the thing, you s snap the cap off and you, you gullop it down and you find it's not cold at all. It's just warm and you want to spit it out of your mouth. More practical for us is uh, in the winter time when you're freezing cold and you come in and you say, I'd love a nice cup of tea. And you, somebody makes the tea for you, but by the time you get it and you sip it, it's gone cold. And you, that's, that's cold, I can't drink that and it's terrible. Now that's, that's the way uh, it was for Jesus. Jesus was let down and even repulsed by the church at Laodicea because of their lukewarmness. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, Jesus says, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, that's, now, that's a bit rough for our refinement today. <laughs> but uh, 
the spitting does go on. <laughs> and sometimes if you get something in your mouth that you really don't want in your mouth, the best thing to do is to spit it out. So here he says, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I'll, you will be no part of me. That's what he's trying to get across. I will make sure that you're out of me and have no part with me. I think implied in the statement is, if you remain as you are, because he hadn't spit them out of his mouth yet, if you remain as you are, I will spit you out of my mouth. So he's looking for, he's looking for change here. He's looking for change. And they must have been aware that just like the person who wanted to drink the cold uh, drink or the, to drink the hot tea and were disappointed, so he was disappointed with the Laodiceans. Very much so. Now why, wh how did they get into this state? Since they were saints in the beginning, how, and they were believers, and they were obeying God. How can you go from there to what he's talking about now for Christians? Their lukewarmness was due to self-deception or self-delusion. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Well, just even as individuals, if you're rich, most rich people see their riches like a high-walled fortification, protecting them from everything. They're lord of all they observe, and nobody can touch them. They are in a place that protects them. And there's nothing they can't buy or nothing they can't get because I haven't got the money to do so. But then it goes into the church. If there's enough pe rich people in the church, contributions are probably quite big. The money is flowing. Repairs can go on to the building. The building can be replaced. The parking lot can be re replaced. Just whatever is, whatever is needed, it's there. We, we can do it. Yes, the Christians were rich and had need of nothing materially. But they were judging according to appearances. They had not yet learned how to judge a righteous judgment. There's a, there's a difference between how we see ourselves and how the Lord sees us. Or how others see us and how we see ourselves. So we, we need to learn to break out of our little capsule and sometimes we've, we find out when there's an argument or whatever what other people really think of us. And we're shocked. <laughs> How could they think that of me? I'm not like that at all. Yes, you are. A lot of times when angry words are said, there's a lot of truth spoken in those angry words. Now, it's not what's being said, it's the way it's being said that's wrong. So... <clears throat> But when, when it comes to our measuring ourselves, and the church for that matter, we need to think God's thoughts. We need to look at it and try and view it from God's standpoint. Which of course means taking into account what the Word of God says. Okay. How easy it is for us to equate or even substitute material prosperity with spiritual prosperity. We think because we're materially prosperous that we're actually spiritually prosperous. And I know from this God channel that I look at sometimes on the television, this has been made a, 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 a big propaganda exercised by a lot of the preachers who are making sure that before you do anything to join them you need to think about your 10% from your wages that you're going to give them. That's the first thing they're ensuring on it. But the, the, the point about it is 
Just because you're wealthy materially doesn't mean you're wealthy spiritually. And that's where they were self-deluded. God's diagnosis of their spirituality was as follows. Let's look at uh, chapter 3, verse 17. He says there, Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know. See, here's the self-delusion. They didn't even know that they were wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I mean, that's shocking. Just imagine if you were walking around with no clothes on and you didn't even know you were walking around with no clothes on. Everybody else would know, but you would, you're entirely oblivious to it. No, this, no, this, you know, it's like the king is in his all together. And everybody is saying, oh, how magnificent he looks, how wonderful he looks. And it's only a little child who could say, he's got no clothes on. Because he could see it for what it really was. There was no playing games, no self-delusion involved in it. This is God's diagnosis of their spiritual condition. Would you be shocked if the Lord said that to us? Maybe he is saying it to us. Paul had said to the Galatians, you were, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Galatians 5 verse 7. Now just because the Galatians were not at the time Paul wrote to them obeying the truth does not mean they never had faith or that they were never saved in Christ Jesus. So the, the, a lot of the denominations now because of the faith only stand are, are saying that, uh, that <coughs> if somebody proves to be unfaithful. He never did have faith in the first place. He never was saved. And they're, they're sticking to that as if it was what God says. Now we know Paul rebuke is rebuking the Galatians, but he didn't say you never had faith. He didn't say you were never saved in the first place. On the contrary, they had fallen from grace according to Paul. And that was because they were now trying to be justified by the law and not by the gospel of God's grace. Now it's easy in the Galatian situation to see that this was all due to false teachers. <clears throat> but when we come to the church in Laodicea, it wasn't because of false teachers. It was because of their selfishness, the love of money, and the ostentatious life. This, throughout the whole world, we now know, or we should know, that this is the main objective for most people in this life. Make money, lots of money. Be ostentatious. If you've got it, flaunt it. Don't be afraid to love the money or the ostentation. And people are going, they're selling their souls for this. They're selling their souls for it because they think it's the be all and the end all for this life. It probably is the be-all and it will be the end-all for this life as well. Their desire for material success had choked out the word of Christ and left them spiritually impoverished. As in the parable of the sower, the seed that fell among the thorns were those who have heard the word of God and in faith obeyed it, but as they went on their way through life, the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, Beware. The pleasures of this life, be very aware. And the desire for other things, which are things you want, not necessarily what God wants, but what you want to the detriment of what God wants for you. The 
this is what had happened here at Laodicea. This, this is what left them in the position of being miserable, of being blind, of being naked. Because that's what it does. When you, when you walk away from Christ or turn your back on Christ and His ways, all that's left is you and what's in you and what's in the world and what you're going to discover, which is what you should have discovered when you obeyed the gospel in the first place, that there's nothing good in you. All the, the evil and all the, the things that you are inside come to the surface again. And when a whole congregation is like this, is it any wonder that Christ was let down or disappointed by them? But there's still hope here. This is, I, I don't want you to get the impression that uh, these were a write-off. There's still hope here because the unfruitful state is not fixed nor is it irreversible. Sometimes when the parable of the sower is, is uh, preached, it looks like each, each section is fixed and irreversible. But it's not, that's not the case. You say, well, it's impossible to change things. Maybe for you, but it's not for God. You must remember this. Instruct those who are rich in the present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. If we turn it back to God and turn our attention to our Lord Jesus Christ, we will realize that all the blessings, both for this life and the next life, actually are sourced in Him. And when we realize that, we will, we will calm down. We don't have to be striving after everything. We don't have to be in competition with everybody else. We can just take the assurance that in him we live, move and exist and that all my needs are going to be taken care of. It's not that I don't have to work. I, I have to cooperate with God. But, but he, if I seek first the kingdom of God, all the things that I need will be added to me. That's what he says. We don't believe it, but that's what he says. Just to remind you. God supplies us with all things, he says, to enjoy. And that's another little point that we need to grasp. I, and I'm talking to myself here as well as everybody else. Where's our joy in the things that we have? Where's our joy in the Lord? Where's our joy in being new, a new creation? In having a hope that is beyond comprehension, it's so great. Where's the joy in it? Something wrong. We have to, we have to start seeing spiritual things as they really are and getting some joy out of the security and the blessings and the righteousness and the goodness that comes of being a Christian. Now we need to, he, Jesus comes back to the congregation. He says, uh, buy from me what you need. Do you not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? Will we wake up to the fact that when we turn our back on the Lord, that's exactly the state we get ourselves into. But Jesus gives them the way to stop the backsliding. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. The spiritual goal, of course, is faith. The refinement of faith are the fires of sufferings that we have to endure here in this life. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. This is just beautiful scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 through 9. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. 
that is being protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. This is all very uplifting stuff. This is what the, the Laodiceans needed to hear. This is what they needed to know. This is how God lifts us and makes life abundant for us rather than hopeless. Isaiah, back in Isaiah 55, talked about you who have no money, come by and eat. So I think it's in the same vein that Jesus is advising them to buy from me white garments, so to speak. You don't have to have money. But you need to know I'm the one that holds it in my power and can give it to you if you ask for it, if you really want it. Your material riches cannot buy what I've got to give you. Your ostentation can't compare with the glory of what I can give you. So they needed faith. And now they need it to have white garments. I think the white garments represent the forgiveness of sins, the sanctification, uh, and the holiness that results from being forgiven and accepted by God. But these white garments are to cover us. These robes are white robes given to the church by God and are described as the righteous acts of the saints, Revelation 19 verse 8. They are given to those who have come through the great tribulation and they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 7 verse 14. God would cover them so that the shame of their nakedness, their sinfulness, will not be revealed. When they were baptized, they were washed and sanctified and justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. But they were to seek continuously sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, he says, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit uh, and serve God in fear of the Lord. Perfecting, says, sorry, sorry, holiness in the fear of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Again, if you abide in sin and die in sin, the shame of your nakedness will be exposed. If you abide in the Lord, your sinfulness will be concealed with a white robe washed in the blood of the Lamb. Brethren, clothe yourself with Christ. Romans 13, 14. Again, Jesus says to them, I advise you to buy from me eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see, he says. Eye diseases were very common back then. The city of Laodicea was famous for its eye ointment. What they could do for others on a physical level, that's how get their eyes right uh, and get them seeing again, uh, God could do for them on a spiritual level. They needed to be able to see themselves. In other words, they needed the eyes to be able to see themselves as God sees them. They also needed to see it was not about what they could do for God, but what God could do for them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus made the invitation, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. If you've got those burdens, come to him. He says, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. All of the, the turbulence and the agitation and the, the fears and the, 
and, and the, the, all that's going on inside and the uncomfortableness of it all, you can be at peace in Jesus Christ our Lord. He'll look after you. He'll take care of it. Just calm down. Give your life over to him. Let him do what he, he does best. God loves, God's love for his people was still there. Those whom I love, he says, I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Although God reproved them, it was only that he could be merciful and forgiving towards them. He's not like trying to beat the lard out of you and destroy you or humiliate you or drag you around the place and make a show of you. All he's trying to do is get you to wake up, see things for what they really are before it's too late. Change. Repent before it's too late. Accept what he's offering you through the forgiveness of sins and the washing of the blood of Christ. That's what he wants for you. But is it what you want for yourself? As he said in another letter, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Maybe there's a few in Laodicea who we hope to reach, who would accept the instructions, who would repent, who would change. And he wanted to give them the chance. I'm sure he wanted the whole church to do it, but you don't necessarily get what you want. Not even God gets what he wants in this regard. So, but if there's, perhaps there is people there. So he gives them the opportunity. And it, it, it's a help to me to think that no matter what the congregation is doing, and no matter how bad some of the people are in the congregation, if I am faithful to the Lord, that will be recognized by God as a worthy life and will be rewarded for it. Even though I've had to put up maybe with all sorts of things that I know are wrong, that I've tried to convince people to change and to do the right thing, and I haven't done it. But if I continue, I can still be accepted before the Lord. And that's very, uh, that's very helpful and very comforting at times. Everyone in Laodicea who repented and changed his or changed his ways, would also walk with Christ in white garments. He who overcomes the evil ones, temptations, trials, and tribulations, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Imagine that. These unworthy, backsliding people were being offered the highest exaltation, the noblest honors, and the most magnificent riches and glory to be enjoyed for eternity. I think I, just as a human, I would have thrown up my hands in despair and said, look, forget it. You're just rubbish. You don't want to do anything that's right. You're just doing your own thing. You're not even listening to God anymore. I give up. I'm, I'm finished. But God doesn't do it. Thank God he doesn't do it. And he makes this tremendous promise to them. And as the hymn says, how wonderful, how marvelous is my Savior's love for me. And that's true. All the blessings of heaven will come for them when they open their eyes and open their hearts to all that God said to them in his word. And contrary to, contrary to the idea that it's God's good pleasure to destroy the wicked, Calvinism. God says, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore repent and live, Ezekiel 18.32. Praise God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the chance to change and be in fellowship with God once more. These people were getting that chance. The question is, did they have an ear to hear what the Spirit was saying to the churches? And for us, the question is, do I have a heart to hear and to change what I know I need to change to be pleasing to the Lord? I'll leave it with you. Please think about those things. <laughs>